Hello and welcome to Limit Studios where we talk anything and everything in entertainment. I'm your official Zeke Lamone and this is part two of our Hamilton Lemmy vs. Limey. We did act one last week and we are doing act two this week. So if you want to see how the Lemmy vs. Limey games work and um, what the score leading up to is, well I'll tell you the score right now, it is 20 Lemmy and 1 Limey and how they got to those scores and all that, you can click on the description below where it takes you to act one or go to the channel <laughs> and just click on the last video before this one. So without further ado, let's get into act number two. We kick off act two with Aaron Burr served once more and he has told us everything that has happened after the war. Alex is now treasurer, not treasurer. <laughs> yeah, he's treasury. Yeah, treasury. I just can't really say it that right. And then we meet Dobby Diggs as Thomas Jefferson in the song, What Did I Miss? And this song is very cool. And like, what I really like about Act 2 more than Act 1 is that there is a narrative through the whole entire thing. Yes, in Act 1, there is a narrative of, well, it's the war and all that stuff. But to me personally, what I'm feeling all of Act 1 was was just introducing people for the most part. It's not really to, until you get to the Winter's Ball. Uh, yes, right hand men to a degree, but most of all, Winter's Balls when it's like, all right, now there's a narrative, and we can actually really follow everything that's going on, as opposed to the earlier ones like, oh, these are some nice songs. I don't know what's happening. I, I made that uh, point already, but that's what I really like about Act 2 more. Uh, there's a narrative to it overall, and Thomas Jefferson is really the main antagonist. There's actually a big thing that historians say is that Thomas Jefferson is, I just realized I do this a lot. What is this? I don't know what this is. Bam, bam, I'm gonna stop doing that. Uh, there is a thing that Thomas Jefferson is actually Hamilton's more big rival, that was horrible grammar, <laughs> than um, Aaron Burr, even though Aaron Burr is the one that shot him. And it's, to true to extent, because like, man, they hold no punches to each other, and within this song, you actually learn how bad of a person Thomas Jefferson is. Uh, in the choreography, you have the ensemble, like, mopping the floor, and <laughs> he had slaves a lot, uh, and he set, makes a note to say, Sally, open up that letter for him, and sh that Sally is actually one of the slaves that he has been known to have relations with and have children with, I believe. I know he, like, let, like, three, I think, three of the kids into his home to stay, like, close to her and all that. Um, and also the beat, I also really like this touch to it, is that, like, it's a 70s styles beat to it to show how behind Thomas Jefferson was since he wasn't here. I also read that that's not true, that he really did come back to America and France quite a bit. But uh, when I looked up for most of it, it said that he did not return to uh, 1789. So... I'm going to say that this is one of the uh, factual parts of Hamilton. Uh, but overall, it's a really good song. I really enjoyed it. And then we get into the cabinet meeting, where Thomas Jefferson and Alex basically just argue. Uh, and it's in the form of a rap battle. I also really like how they brought the mics off as if it was a tan dual commandment. I, I really enjoyed that as well. Uh, overall, it's a very, very good start to the second act. I actually prefer this start more than act one. So I'm going to give it a lemmy to start off. Also, I want to give a shout out to Oak, who plays James Madison. I uh, rehearsed his full name uh, so many times, and I just don't feel like I pronounce it right. And in the uh, interviews I looked up with him to know how to pronounce his name right, he said, whichever name is easier for you to say. And I really don't want to disrespect him in any way by butchering the name horribly. He seems like a great guy, so he probably wouldn't be mad if I attempted it. But I'm just going to call him Oak because he said, that's okay. You can call me Oak. So I'm going to go with that. Uh, yeah, Oak plays uh, James Madison, and he is great for the roles that he plays. I wish he had a bigger role because his flow is really, really good. And then we uh, take a break. Uh, we meet Philip Hamilton, first of two sons named Philip. Don't know why the Hamiltons would do that. That would be really confusing to go, fill up, and then both of them come down. It would be just re really weird. Anyway, the first Philip Hamilton is played by Anthony Ramos. And he is now going to be playing um, Usnavi in, in the Heights in the uh, film version that's coming out later this summer on both HBO Max and theaters. Nice little plug for him. 
And this really moves the story forward a lot. I think a lot of time passes, in all, in all honesty. I think months passed because of uh, the turntables are moving forward quite a bit. Uh, the Hamiltons and Angelica leave. And then, like, Hamilton and Angelica are also um, writing notes. Alex Han Alexander Hamilton and Angelica. When I say the Hamiltons, I meant minus Alex because the whole song is basically Angelica and Eliza telling him, Yo, just take it easy. Take some time off. It's going to be fine. It's going to be fine. You're, you're, you're good. Let's go. Let's go upstate. You'll be fine. He's like, no, nah, I can't. <laughs> and anyway, they're writing notes to each other. And he mentions Macbeth. And Macbeth is actually a very important thing in uh, Broadway history. And I don't think I can really uh, explain it very well. So I'm going to take it to Professor Lemon. We're going to go to his classroom. And he's going to show us what Macbeth really is. Um, thank you, Zane. Uh, <clears throat> <coughs> I'm Professor Lemon, and I'm going to show you what Macbeth makes. So if we go to the uh, board here, <coughs> All right, Corona. Um, there is a Scottish play. The name is Macbeth. It is a uh, old uh, superstition uh, within the uh, confines of the theater. Is that if you uh, say the name Macbeth, uh, there's going to be bad luck throughout your whole entire production of your theater. Um, <clears throat> it's okay to say the Scottish play, but you do not say Macbeth. Now, how did this uh, superstition begin? Uh, no one really knows, um, and uh, it's just a fun thing to do, pretty much. Now, let's get back to that idiot in a referee shirt who thinks he's an official with movies. Idiot? Wow, how... How rude! I, I, I invited you on the show and you treat me. I, I passed this class. I, I passed this class, okay? I, I'm not an idiot. A anyway, so then we move on to say no to this, and this is uh, Jasmine Jones who plays Mariah Reynolds, and also a little fun fact her and Nancy Ramos are actually engaged in real life. I just found that very adorable. And basically, this whole song is Hamilton saying, My mind's telling me no. But my body, my body's telling me yes, and he has an affair, and then you know her husband actually found out about it, and now you know he's in the case of blackmail, where basically Hamilton just has to pay him out, you know, to keep the hush hush, and you know he can keep doing whatever he wants with her. So prostitution, and then we move on in to knows in the room where it happens, the room where it happens. I, I said I wasn't going to sing it, but these songs are just so catchy, <laughs> and again. Freaking Leslie Odom Jr. as Aaron Burr is fantastic. We are going to give him a Lemmy for this. Uh, not just for Leslie Odom being so great as Aaron Burr, but, you know, it was just really smart that this song, you know, is about what happened with Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, and, yeah, James Madison and Alexander Hamilton as they uh, discuss uh, what will come, that the capital will be in D.C., Hamilton gets all this financial power, and what was really cool about it is that no one really was in the room where it happened. They had to be out of shut doors, and then they came out and like, so this is what's happening. They're like, oh okay, and we just did a bad night and all that. So for that alone, for it to be smart to choose someone who was outside the room singing about it uh, is very smart, and that's why we give a Lemmy for the song. And also, it's just freaking great. I think it's probably the best song in the whole entire second act. Also, another reason for the Lemmy is that with the blocking of Aaron Burr as well. You see, they had Aaron Burr only walk in straight lines because from up in this point, this was, Aaron Burr was like a very focused person. Like, all right, unless I'm very certain of it, I'm not going to do anything because, again, talk less, smile more. And this is the first time where he curves because this is the big turning point for Aaron Burr as well. So that is another reason for the Lemmy of, of why I am giving the room where it happened let me. Now we're moving on into Skyler Defeated, and this song is very simple. Aaron Burr took over Alexander Hamilton's father-in-law's job, and now he's a Democratic Republican, and Alexander is just mad about it. Another cabinet meeting happens. Thomas Jefferson and Alexander fight some more. And then Washington's on your side. It's another fun song. But this is basically just Jefferson, Madison, and Burr trying to think of a plan to bring down Hamilton, which they come to the conclusion of, hey, we need to run against Washington and become president to get him out of power. And then Washington says, you know what, guys, you're right. I'm going to step down. 
So, then we get one last time. I, I, I really need to stop singing. I'm, I'm, I'm butchering these songs. I'm sorry, guys, but I'm having a good time. <laughs> um, and this is basically Washington saying goodbye, and Hamilton's like, you know, maybe don't. <laughs> uh, whether Hamilton really thinks Washington's the best president of all time, or maybe Hamilton knows, oh man, if this guy leaves, I'm in trouble with my political power and such. Uh, I think it's more of that. Also, was Washington really stepping down for legacy? That's, let's really think about it. You know, after eight years, you're doing a job, you're running a whole country, don't you get a little tired? You're just like, man, I need a break. I don't want to do this anymore. And he just twisted it to be like, you know, I just don't want another king and all this stuff. You know, it's best if I step down. No, no, I insist. I must go, and we must show that our powers, you know, we just keep changing leaders and all of that. I think he was more tired. I'm kidding. <laughs> also, I really like how at the end of the song that uh, Hamilton... I guess Hamilton helped write the farewell address. I, I didn't really read much about that. Uh, I just know that the farewell address is pretty much in the song, and Hamilton is saying it, while Christopher Jackson, who plays Washington, is singing it. I think that's a really good blend, and again, another really good song. I think it's the second best song, right behind the room where it happens, and I will give another Lemmy for this song alone. The King's back, and that's always a very happy sight to see, so we're gonna give him a Lemmy. And then it's the Adams administration where they say John Adams fired Hamilton, but that's not true because Hamilton actually resigned in December right before Adams took over as president. And, you know, Adams is mad in the story book anyway because, you know, he was fired. And then Tom Jefferson's like, look, as long as he holds a pen, we're a threat, so we need to let him know what we know. So they think that they know him, but in reality, they have no idea because they think that Alex is probably smuggling money or drugs or something with all these payments that he's making to this one person and then i said like, nah i'm not doing that you know what i'm cheating that's what i'm doing and it, it's weird it's like he takes pride in it <laughs> uh and you know they're like okay damn all right sure uh yeah no we won't tell anyone uh no one was in the room where it happened as aaron burr would say and then it's time for the hurricane and i gotta shout out to the ensemble because like man these visuals are great the way they're holding everything and this ensemble really holds the whole story together really much. Uh, I know a lot of people like look at the ensemble and they just kind of look past it because they're not a main character, but to me, without them, this show is nothing. <laughs> In all honesty, so a standout moment for them. Five points to the ensemble themselves. And then it's time for the Reynolds plant pamphlet. Another quick song, look. I said I appreciate the second act more because there is story. I mean, everything's building, building, building. It's much more easier to follow. Uh, I did the hand thing again. Um, however, this is quick song after quick song after quick song after quick song. And also, oddly enough, the second act is longer than the first act. I, I, I found that very strange. Um, it's just, I really felt like these would have been much more beneficial with scenes than songs. Look, I, I enjoy the songs. I did the hand thing again, I'm gonna stop. Um, I enjoy the songs. I, I, I truly do. But again, I just feel like there'd be more off to it. And that is also very present with Burn with Eliza being mad. Just think a scene of Eliza going off on Hamilton besides singing it, you know, burning down the papers, which a cool fact about that song is that those papers were actually a type of paper that only lasted on fire for as long as the song went. So as soon as the song was over, it went out. I, I, I found that very, very cool. And I don't remember the name of the papers, but I did see it. <laughs> but a lot of the second act, I really felt like would have been beneficial to scenes rather than songs. Like I really only think maybe four songs I would actually keep. The finale song, The Room Where It Happens, One Last Time, maybe. Yeah, I think I would have kept one last time. And then probably the opener with Thomas Jefferson. Besides that, all the other songs, I think they could have been more beneficial to scenes rather than songs. Well, maybe say no to this as well. But yeah, that's just my thought. So a line for, I guess, quick songs rather than scenes. We think Philip has been 19 years since then, and he is saying that he's going to blow us all away, 
and that is the title of the song, and he is going to challenge the man to a duel for respecting his father. I cannot remember the name off the top of my head. Sorry. Um, but he does go and talk to some two girls, and one of them is the bullet, who we know is basically death. So, and in that scene, he's basically saying, hey, let's strip down to our socks afterwards. So he's basically flirting with death. Uh oh. Uh oh. Oh. So, oh no, this duel ain't gonna be good. Yep. So, Philip gets shot. And he is trying to stay alive. And that is, we move into staying alive rephrase, which is one of the very few rephrases. Both of the rephrases, the. Uh, the one in Act 1 and this one, like, they actually mean something. Like, most of the time in the rephrase, they're like, yeah, let's just play this song again. That's what it feels like. But both of these, I'm like, huh, there's actually umph to these. And Philip dies. <laughs> uh, it's not funny. I, it, sorry, when I when I talk about actual serious things, I can't help but laugh. Um, and so that explains why they named another son Philip. But then it comes the question of how do they have another kid? Doesn't Eliza hate Hamilton? And like, they're not divorced, but he has to sleep in the other room. Like, she don't want no part of him. Don't touch me. Don't look at me. Don't even think about me. Is basically what she's saying. Well, then we transition to it's quiet uptown. The Hamiltons move uptown, where it's quiet, obviously. And Hamilton basically uses the words that Eliza used on him when Philip was first discovered to Hamilton. Uh... Look at where we are, and all those things. I, Sorry, I can't just say the words. I have to sing them. <laughs> and uh, basically, he uses that, and that is enough for her to forgive him, and they get back together. So, and now they're back together, and then it's time for the election of 1800. And everyone's want to know, who is Hamilton going to endorse? Because it's very important. Because really, John Adams didn't really do anything. He sucked. <laughs> as a president, and it was basically a three-man race, but not really. It was really between Aaron Burr and Thomas Jefferson. And Alexander Hamilton endorsed Thomas Jefferson more than Aaron Burr, which is very true, um, which is shocking to me. So it really showed that Hamilton really did think about what was best for the country because Jefferson had beliefs and Burr had none. And that hurt Burr's feelings, and... <laughs> He wrote Hamilton a note uh, saying, I demand an apology. And Hamilton's like, no, I'm not going to apologize for what I believe in. You know this. And so they duel. So Burr has gone full heel. And basically we show the build to this heel turn uh, for Aaron Burr. And then we get into the best of wives. I really don't get why this song is here. I really don't know why you can just go from your obedient servant to the world was wide enough. Like that part just felt extra and just felt really out of place to me. So we're gonna give another line for best of wives. Then it's time for the world is wide enough, which is basically a remix of the 10 Dual Commandments sung by Aaron Burr. And also it's a two part thing because they go through the whole two 10 Dual Commandments and then once the duel is shot and then Hamilton is like going through his whole life pretty much. And Lin-Manuel Miranda actually had a hard time writing this last part because he didn't know what should his last moments be. But it wasn't until he, they just had like a, uh, him and his wife just like had a baby. And they have animals and all that. And he set the baby to bed. He was asleep. His wife was resting. And his animals were also asleep. And it was just really quiet. And I guess when he lay down, he was like, huh, there's nothing going on here. He went, oh my god, it's silence, that's the beat. And then everyone woke up and his wife made him sleep on the couch. But he was like, that's fine. He went to his piano and wrote anyway. <laughs> I don't know about that last part, but I'm pretty sure. He was like, huh, it's silence. And he went to his piano and he probably went very silent. He probably didn't wake up everyone. Anyways, uh, so he goes through his whole entire life. It really wraps up everything very well. We're going to give it a lemmy for The World Was Wide Enough. It is now time for the finale song, Who Lives, Who Dies, Who Tells Your Story. And to me, this is the main lesson of the movie. This is what the movie is really trying to drive home to you, is that you don't, you don't have any control of that. You don't have control of who lives, who dies, and who tells your story. And to me, that's not shown more than with Aaron Burr. I really do think he is a, the real main character in this movie. To me, personally, because 
as I said in the last video, Theodosia died really young. Uh, she was lost at sea and then basically assumed dead. And obviously she's actually dead now. Um, and so she died before him. Therefore, she wasn't around to tell his story. Also, his wife, Theodosia, because he named his daughter after Theodosia, I believe they were only married for like five or ten years before she passed away. And so the one person he truly loved, and probably the one person who truly loved him, wasn't around to tell his story. And Eliza, who truly loved Hamilton, was around to tell his story. She kept his story alive, interviewed all of his uh, soldier friends, opened up an orphanage for him in this song as well, and all these things. She kept herself in the narrative, and she spread his story, so Alexander Hamilton is still able to live on, if you will. While Burr didn't really have anyone because he never really stood up for anything, so no one could really connect with him besides probably his daughter and his wife, who died before him. So we don't really know the true nature of Aaron Burr. Like, there's some things that we learned about him. Like, yeah, he was a big woman activist, but he wasn't going to do that in the public because it was the wrong thing then. Also, with the uh, Eliza's gasp at the end, I feel like she, and I also think she could also make a case that this story is really about her as well uh, because she is the one that kept the story alive. Like, you could say this whole play is her telling people about what Hamilton did. So, I can see that argument as well, but to me, Aaron Burr is the true protagonist of the show, even though the show is named Hamilton. Um, and the gasp at the end, I don't think, like, she's dying. Like, some people say, I think she's actually seeing the future because there's no more slavery. Blacks are now uh, known as equals, which is a great thing. And also, orphanages, orphans are respected. That's probably not the best word to use, but I can't really think of a better word right now. And all these things, I think she's just proud. I think that gasp is proudness to me. And, like, everything's just really wrapped up well. That is the end of Hamilton, and, man, Lin-Manuel freaking went to a whole other level when he wrote this play. And it is definitely an outstanding point. So, like, it is... Yeah, it deserves the five lemmies, so give him the five lemmies. <laughs> Hamilton became a cultural phenomenon. Like, we can't ignore that, especially with the Disney Plus thing. Like, it became such a big, big hit. I think Lin Manuel and his crew knew that this would be successful because In the Heights was successful. Like, In the Heights was such an unknown, and then they won, you know, the, the uh, Tony. Is, it, is, that, is that what it's called? The, the, where, where Broadway comes together? I think it's called the Tonys. And, you know, they won all that. So I think they really knew they were comfortable, like, we're going to do good. But I didn't think they expect to be, like, wow, such a big, big, huge hit. Where, like, it's basically worldwide at this point. Like, they just went to Europe uh, before the pandemic hit. I think, well, before then as well. I, I, I wanted to say it. I was like, oh, people, before a pandemic. <laughs> um, it's just absolutely phenomenal. Like, the only thing that we knew about Alexander Hamilton before Hamilton that was in pop culture was a Got Milk commercial directed by Michael Bay. <laughs> it's true. Look it up. Look it up. I think that's Michael Bay's first directing credit as well, is that commercial for Got Milk. It's actually a pretty good commercial. His Michael Bayisms were still there. He had a lot to figure out still. Um, but, yeah, I just, I just found that really cool. So, yeah, to me... But the debate of when is Hamilton going to become a movie? Because a lot of people are like, there needs to be a movie, there needs to be a movie, there needs to be a movie. And I think me and probably Len are the only ones who are against it. Right now, my, my mind can always change. But to me, Hamilton is the perfect theater show. It, it, it truly is. It has hit songs and all that. Yes, I do believe that there should be... Some songs should have been taken out. I believe there should have been scenes instead of it being basically the uh, hip-hop Les, Les, Ma, Les Miserables, I can't say it, Les Mis. <laughs> um, I, I truly do believe that, but to me it is still the perfect theater show. Like, you know you're going to have a good time, you're going to enjoy the songs. My editor, who doesn't even like Broadway that much, he watched it and he was dreading it, and he, and he texted me going, you know what, those songs are pretty good. So to me, the perfect theater show. I, I truly believe that. As a movie, though, because you got to add a third act, 
I really do believe Hamilton will face the same conflict as Cass, because there's no way that original Broadway Cass is going to do it, because the movie's probably not going to come to another 10 years. If that, to write a whole third act, and you probably have to take some songs out, and I think that, I, I don't think there's any way you can win, because that whole beginning is basically just introduction after introduction after introduction after introduction. Now, sure, there's going to be someone who's much smarter than me and much more creative than me that could probably make it a lot better, and I can mo very well be wrong. And I hope I am when the movie does come out. I do believe it's inevitable. But to me, personally, I don't really need a Hamilton movie. I think it's perfect where it is. But I will acknowledge it is probably inevitable that it will come out. So that will do it for us, guys, with a score of 36 or 7 to 3, I believe. Either way, Lemmy won, and you do have to win by 30 to be a Strawberry Lemonade. So Hamilton is the very first Lemmy versus Liney Strawberry Lemonade movie. Or play, I should say. I say we're still looking for the first movie because this is mainly a play, but it is very deserving. Round of applause to Hamilton for being our very first Strawberry Lemonade Lemmy versus Liney. That will do it for me, guys. Don't forget to follow me on the socials, wherever... Draven puts it. Also, don't forget to subscribe and hit that ring bell, and I will see you all here next time at Lemon Studios.